speaking in front of a very, very clever physicians is a rather intimidating task. Uh, that too, I practice uh, specifically knee and hip surgery, but even then, I must say, as one of my senior colleagues, Dr. Kalari, was just saying, it is not about whether you practice an individual part of orthopedics or practice any branch of medicine. It is a topic which is so relevant, I suppose, to each and every one of us. Uh, I will try and not delve into too much of the technical details, but I'll try and present a little bit of a summary of what to look at when you're treating hypertension. Uh, I'm sorry, osteoporosis. <laughs> osteoporosis. <laughs> so, osteoporosis essentially is decreasing of the bone mass. It is a very common bone disease, as we all know, and it increases the risk of fractures. It, of course, is decreasing the microarchitecture of bone, but more than anything else, it is not the quality of bone that changes, it is just the bone mass which reduces. Just to explain that, I've just put up this picture. So the quality, so that some of you might know, is an eminent uh, in the film personality. So the quality, the person remains the same. It's only that the physical mass is less. What is important to understand here is that osteoporosis does not mean that the patients, if they have fracture, the fractures will not heal. Fractures do heal. It is only that the actual bone mass is less. So the bone is weaker, but the quality of bone is the same. Now, it is enough a common problem. It is very common, as all of us know, one in three women, one in five men, all across the world over the age of 50 will have some amount of osteoporosis. And in India, it is rather worse, even though we don't have that much of a prevalence in males, we do have osteoporosis at relatively younger ages. And I think it's very important for us to see why that happens. So what happens in osteoporosis really is that the common presentation is insidious fractures. We do not know that somebody is osteoporotic just on their own. Some, uh, you know, you could be osteoporotic and you could and you may not have any symptoms. You may have some vague bone pains, but most commonly, you realize that you're osteoporotic only when you've fallen down without any obvious major trauma, and then suddenly you discover that you had a fracture. You didn't really fall much, but you had a fracture. Your back or your elder sister's, your mother's back has suddenly gone like this. Why? Because they've developed asymptomatic fractures. That is actually the worry. The impact of fractures, especially if it presents with something like a hip fracture, is huge. And I, I'm, I'm sure the orthopedic surgeons here know, but for those who don't, especially for juniors, having a hip fracture, whether you like it or not, out of 100 patients who have a hip fracture, orthopedic surgeons treat hip fractures on a daily basis. Out of 100 patients that you might have treated this year, you must realize that at least 30 of them will not be alive to see the next year. So it is that huge because it is, it is a beginning of the failure of the entire system. Talking about osteoporosis and age. So it is not everybody who's old will be osteoporotic. It is important to understand that there are many other factors which can cause osteoporosis at the young age. And this is why we probably have to think about why we are getting osteoporosis in younger ages in India. Now, that picture there, there is what looks like a father and a daughter, but just on the lighter side of things, you see, that may not have done much to the father, but see what it does to the daughter. So, you could have many, many causes for osteoporosis. You could have genetic diseases. You could have things like rheumatoid arthritis. You could have nutritional problems, hormonal problems, which are getting more and more common as the years are advancing. Our lifestyles are certainly not healthy. So definitely, I am 
by definition, bound to be much more osteoporotic than my grandfather was. Causes. When we talk about causes, you know, that picture itself is self-explanatory. Our children today don't want to eat healthy food at home. They want parties at KFC and McDonald's. And are these foods really going to achieve what we want in terms of adequate nutrition for our bones? Our bones will keep on adding nutrition and becoming stronger till we are 35 years of age. But if the foundation is that, are they going to achieve that peak bone mass? If they don't, we are much more likely to be osteoporotic. More and more of us don't really go outdoors for exercise. And if we do exercise, often exercise is a bit like this. We cheat ourselves. We think we're doing exercise, but actually it is not really exercise. That is the reason we wear. We could be, see, that person sweating as well. So it is important. That is probably what could put all of us at higher risk of osteoporosis. So I was shooting out words like peak bone mass. What is this actually? We have a good mathematical measure called as a DEXA scan, which basically measures a score for what your bone mass should be in comparison to the peak bone mass of an average adult. So if your bone mass is that of an average adult, you're normal. And depending on how much your bone mass is less than that, that makes you a varying grade of osteoporosis. So if your bone mass is one standard deviation less to about 2.5 standard deviation less as shown on that yellow zone there, then you would be classified as weak bone or osteopenic. Whereas if it is less than that, you're definitely osteoporotic. So, peak bone mass, we say, is achieved at about 35 years of age. So, it is like the first few years of your childhood really influence your character. The first few years of your childhood will also influence what sort of bone mass you develop and will influence how you are in your later life. There is, of course, everybody as they get older, so I'm already past my peak bone mass many, many years. So a lot of people over here are over 35. So we are already past our peak bone mass. So we will be somewhere, if you look at from that T score, somewhere maybe possibly in that yellow zone. But are we all osteoporotic? To pacify all this and to make sure all of us just don't classify ourselves as osteoporosis, there is what is called as a Z score, which basically compares us to an average person our age. So if I am 42 at the moment, my peak bone mass will obviously be, obviously be less than that of a 30, 35 year old person, but it might be average compared to that of a 40 to 45 year old person. Similarly, a 70 year old person would have a less bone mass than me, but that doesn't mean he's definitely osteoporotic. He might be average for what is expected for his age. And that is what is you know, certified by the Z score. So what DEXA scan is, is the only quantitative measure for osteoporosis. It is basically measuring the mass of bone. It is X-ray. It is a different type of X-ray. It is a dual X-ray absorptiometry, which is done by a specific machine. It is telling us the amount of bone in the lumbar spine and in the hip area. Why the lumbar spine and hip area? Because that is where you know most of the osteoporosis happens. That is where the commonest fractures related to osteoporosis are. And that is a kind of an average thing where it can be measured easily. So that is what is measured. And that can be quantified. You can quantify treatment. You can guide treatment on the basis of your bone mass in those areas. So that is the only proper bone mass measuring tool we have. There is, you must have heard of and conducted many osteoporosis scans where they, you know, just put the heel in, in an ultrasound machine. Now, this is a screening tool, but if somebody turns out osteoporotic there, it may not be enough evidence for somebody to be put on one, two, three treatment, beware. It is, it is a cheap and a screening tool, but it should be used as a screening tool. It can have a lot of false negatives. 
So there are, of course, a lot of fancy other things we can do, but these things we don't commonly do. This is just to kind of, uh, you know, complete the theory. This is probably more for people who are resistant to drugs and things like that. You have bone markers, markers of bone turnover, enzymes, and all that sort of thing. Then there are, what is more practical is this. There is a tool which is given by the WHO. It's just a questionnaire available online. You answer the questionnaire and that gives you a risk of whether you are likely to have a fracture over the next five to 10 year period. Depending on that score, there are good guidelines which tell you whether you can start treatment or no. So, before we get on to treatment, what is important to us is to understand what led to the cause. So, needless to say, good diet, good exercise is more important than anything else. So, back to naturals. Natural food and good food can do a lot. I'm not advertising for any brand here. So, as I'm not advertising for Kedilla, <laughs> that's the difference. This is a scientific session. So, uh, it is good diet, good food, calcium and vitamin D. A lot of modern foods, a lot of processed foods may not have enough calcium. We eat fast foods all the time, but we don't realize whether we are getting adequate intakes of calcium and vitamin D. Similarly, talking about calcium and vitamin D here, calcium and vitamin D are not a treatment of osteoporosis. <coughs> yes, it is very important to give calcium and vitamin D because we need to replenish doses. What is happening particularly with vitamin D is though in our country we have a lot of sun, all of us run away from sun these days. So yes, it could be that if we do levels of all our vitamin Ds, about 50% of us might come low. But, I mean, we wonder whether this is a modern lab or pharma-generated disease of hypovitaminosis D uh, because, uh, you know, all of us can't be that deficient. But it is certainly true that our newer generations are not getting exposure to sunlight which would naturally make vitamin D. We are not having naturally rich foods in vitamin D. And we are not exposing ourselves to that much of outdoor activity which is important for our bodies to actually absorb calcium from our diets. So in that sense, it might be worthwhile for somebody to have a supplement depending on their lifestyle. It is not important to treat every patient out there with calcium and vitamin D. Talking about vitamin D, it is, if you think somebody has muscle pains or bone pains, it is probably good to give a replacement vitamin D treatment because six, seven, or eight doses like we normally give of vitamin D cannot produce harm. Too much of vitamin D, particularly iron vitamin D, which is commonly given, can produce harm. And that should not be given unless it is tested. But for the routine patient, you can certainly give them eight tablets or one weekly doses of vitamin D without any side effects. Uh, that whole treatment would cost you something like 300 rupees rather than order a vitamin D levels test, which would cost you 1,500, 2,000 rupees. So in that sense, that is the place of calcium and vitamin D. They are supplements, not everybody requires them. It is important in the elderly age group, of course, rather than just think about treatment, to talk about and think about what their environment at home is like and think about what precautions they can take for fall prevention, etc. So, for treatment of osteoporosis, there are specific guidelines. So guidelines would say if your T-score is definitely osteoporotic, if you're osteopenic, you might treat and watch with dietary supplements and things like that. But if you're osteoporotic, if you've already had fractures, and if by that frac stool assessment your risk of fractures is high, then you definitely need treatment. That is pharmacologic treatment for osteoporosis. Talking about pharmacologic therapy, you have basically two types of medications. So think about a water tank. You have a water tank which is leaking from the bottom, as all of our municipal tanks are. Uh, so it is similarly, similarly for osteoporosis. So we have our bone mass which is bound to leak. And that is what uh, osteoporosis is all about. As we age, that bone mass starts leaking from the bottom. So we have drugs which stop the leak at the bottom, or we have one drug which actually puts more water from the top. 
So that drug is relatively new, whereas the drugs which stop the leak are many and have been tried for a long time. The first line drugs, of course, are, oops, sorry, <coughs> Uh, are uh, uh, bisphosphonates, that is uh, alendronate and uh, you know the whole group. Uh, there is now uh, more and more usage of the drug called zolendronate, which is basically IV, which can be given once a year. And the only reason I think this could be given in our setup is because patients are not going to be as compliant to taking weekly doses of alendronate. Now, the pharma industry will give you loads of preparations, but the, uh, the monthly drug, ibandronate, which is actually put down in the guidelines uh, from America as a second line drug. Then there are other drugs you can modify, you know, hormones. So particularly in post-menopausal osteoporosis comes raloxifene, which acts like an uh, uh, agonist to estrogens, which help, uh, 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 you know, uh, increase the bone mass in females. Coming to calcitonin, all of us know these drugs, so I'm not going to go through these drugs in detail. Coming to calcitonin, calcitonin is again helping our body to decrease the leakage of the bone, that is, uh, decrease the uh, decrease of bone mass, and that helps more. It, it, it comes as a nasal spray. It comes uh, derived from fish, that is salmon, and it cannot be administered orally. So it has to be done as a nasal spray. But where calcitonin works, particularly, is in pains. So if you have bone pains, particularly related to um, hunchbacks or osteoporotic vertebral fractures, that is where calcitonin <coughs> helps work uh, best. Coming to patients who already had a very high fracture risk and who you then want to treat, we should and you know start thinking of the anabolic drug, which is teriparatide. I'll talk about teriparatide in a minute. So, talking about new drugs, there is no magic drug out there which can do instant treatment. So, we have to understand that these drugs will require a lot of patient compliance and the effect will be slow. Our patients many times want magic therapies but that happens in ads. That doesn't happen in real practice. So it's not going to work for her, obviously. Coming to teriparatide. So this is the only drug which is hormone derived and it is a bone forming drug. It is ideally, like I said, an indication for secondary osteoporosis or for those people who have an extremely high fracture risk, like we talked about, for somebody who's already had one or two vertebral fractures, who's already presented to you with a hip fracture, you've done a DHS or whatever it is, you might want to send a patient home with teriparatide. The good thing about teriparatide is that it is incredibly safe and it has proven to be safe. I think Cadilla is thinking of coming out with it, and the, uh, that is why I'm looking forward to the uh, to what I'm going to talk about as a downside of teriparatide. Teriparatide, as uh, I'm sure the senior surgeons all or senior or doctors all know, has been around for a long time, and what we have today is something which costs. It is it is a daily injection, which a patient has to self inject. The kit and all are very easy. The patient can easily be taught to do this, but it costs it costs about five thousand rupees per month on an average. It might be less, might be a little more. However, what we had when it came first was at least five to six times that much. So, like mobile phones and mobile calls are much cheaper than they were ten years ago, so is teriparatide much cheaper than it was five years ago. And uh, I would uh, look forward to innovation from Cadilla as to whether they can make it even more accessible to the common Indian citizen. If you are giving your patient teriparatide, it is very important to understand that it is not going to be enough to give them just a few injections of teriparatide. So if it is a type of patient who is going to take your treatment for a week, 
then go to the uh, you know your colleague next door or in the third week go to some ayurveda or homeopathic person there is no point recommending teriparatide if you're giving teriparatide and for it to work it has to be bare minimum 6 months otherwise it is not going to work so it is very important to counsel patients when you give it when you're giving teriparatide the second important thing is if you've already tried a lot of bisphosphonate what bisphosphonates do, and I've not put a separate slide on this, what we've realized after years and years of bisphosphonates, alendronate, abandronate, whatever else was used in the Western world, is after having given it for about two years, three years, five years continuously, the bone, of course, gets a bit stronger. But, like I said, it is the bottom leak which is stopping. It is not additional strength of bone coming in. So the strength of bone remains at what it is, and we are trying to stop the resorption of bone. So what we are doing essentially at the bony level is we are stopping the bony remodeling. So bone is a continuously remodeling structure where you have osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And these drugs stop the osteoclastic activity. What happens if you give bisphosphonates for a long, long time is the bone is going to get brittle and hard. The problem is we started seeing in the Western world patients after continuous three-year therapy or four-year, five-year therapy on bisphosphonates, they were getting fractures. I mean, they were like they would usually get fractures because the bone mass is not increasing. It is just you're stopping the remodeling. The bone becomes extremely brittle. And because this bone has forgotten to remodel, the fractures that happen when patients are on long-term bisphosphonate therapy are extremely difficult to heal. These fractures don't heal very easily. They are very difficult to fix because the bone is extremely brittle. So beware. If your patient is on bisphosphonate, uh, bisphosphonate therapy, you give them a break. Give them a year of bisphosphonate therapy, stop it for six months or a year. If they are on bisphosphonate therapy, immediately don't start teriparatide. Give it a break. Let that bone start having some normal development of you know, osteoclasts. Then start giving the teriparatide. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Of course, there are many, many newer agents out there. There are agents which are antibodies against the bone resorption uh, enzymes. So all these things are a bit too clever for an orthopedic surgeon to understand. But even then, uh, these are not that commonly used. It is not that easily available. Strontium was available. But again, strontium uh, showed on x-rays a better bone quality after it was given for a few years. But again, strontium was not uh, in, in the same quality of bone as the bisphosphonates were doing. So uh, there were, of course, some questions about toxicity of a metal like strontium. And the quality of bone, again, was a bit more brittle. So it is not all that popular now. There are, of course, a few newer agents on the horizon. There are antibodies which can be done, uh, which might be effective. I think these are a bit you know, too far-fetched for the Indian context just yet, because even though teriparatide has become cheap, we are thinking teriparatide is expensive for our population, so this is definitely going to be far-fetched. So there's antibodies, there is parathyroid hormone-related proteins, and there are, you know, inhibitors which probably could work in people who are resistant to hormones, who have secondary osteoporosis and other things. But till then, this is what we've got. We've got teriparatide, and if you're prescribing it to your patients, remember to counsel them properly. And if you're giving bisphosphonates, remember bisphosphonates can have problems, so counsel them properly again. When it comes to new drugs, just as a conclusive statement, we all tend to take new things very easily. Like this, this person, he's just, you know, thought of some new kick and he's jumping naked into this pond here. And you can come back with very, very serious side effects. So when you're thinking of something new, think first that the drug is safe. We have drugs which are proven, use them, rather than just going on to something which is new. So innovation is good, but at the same time, make sure when something is innovated, we have got trials in the right place. So companies like this, which are at the forefront, 
If they come out with new drugs, they can probably help us set up multi-center trials as to compliance and this and that. And that is how we as doctors can help propagate that drug in the general population. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yogesh. Uh, now the session is open for discussion. So any questions from the audience can be directed. Not that good. So I, I put them on teriparatide. And we have found over time, I have obviously not done DEXA to kind of, uh, you know, talk on a, a, a kind of a very objective personal experience. But I can see the bone quality. Uh, getting better on the x-ray, on serial x-rays over six months to one year, definitely. Uh, what I particularly uh, treat teriparatide, so apart from the fracture risk, because I don't treat fractures because of my personal experience, I treat them in conjunction with my rheumatologist. So any patient who has secondary osteoporosis, teriparatide is really believed to help well. And that is something I see on a very common basis because uh, what we tend to get with rheumatoid is more localized osteoporosis. So after replacements, because rheumatoid replacements we are doing at a much younger age as compared to the average population, uh, when we take x-rays of both knees standing together, we could definitely see a difference on one side and the other side in terms of localized osteoporosis. And after six months to a year, you see that difference equalizing with teriparatide. <coughs> DEXA, I would do more, I mean, after, when, I'm, when I'm seeing patients, if, if they are pre-op or I'm not thinking of doing any intervention, I would do a DEXA. But I, I haven't had personal experience of doing DEXA post-implantation. And, uh, you know, uh, when, when I've clearly seen intraoperatively that somebody is very osteoporotic, I've just given it. Excuse me, sir. I, I personally prefer weekly bisphosphonates, but if I, and that is according to the guidelines, they say the first line should be weekly, and if you think your patient is not compliant to take weekly bisphosphonates, just give them a, a yearly zolendronate. There was uh, earlier injections like amitronate, etc., which was given every six months, but those were more for hypocalcemias. They should not be recommended in the general population. So those were more for tumorous situations and uh, you know, you have the osteodystrophies which cause hypercalcemia, fibrous dysplasia, etc. They work there. So, for primary osteoporosis, it is uh, alendronate or zolendronate. How do you assist their bone strength? Do you assist them with the dental scan? Or after TKI, you assist the dental scan? After 70 years, if if somebody is having, uh, uh, what I would tend to do is, if somebody is having generalized symptoms related to osteoporosis or some other fractures, if they presented for a TKR, it it is already their mobility and all is really poor. So I would do the TKR and then postoperatively put them on bisphosphonates. I wouldn't uh, uh, particularly uh, wait for um, the uh, osteoporosis to be better with bisphosphonates and then do the TKR because anyways we are doing cemented uh, uh, replacements so uh, TKR is almost always cemented so it doesn't make that much of a difference when you're talking about giving the patient mobility because you can give them most, uh, bisphosphonates and prescribe exercises at the same time. Um, if uh, somebody is 80 plus, then the indications for treating osteoporosis are not that much, really. Because uh, uh, if somebody is, I mean, especially in relation to elective orthopedics, because if somebody is mobile to the extent in India that they want a replacement after 80 years, that means they're quite good. Even in the Western world, it is not that recommended. The recommendations are not for more than 80 years treating with this hospital. I use zolendronic acid. I use zolendronic acid more in the 60 to 60 to 75 year age group. How many? How many years? You assisted radiologically with zolendronic acid, or you use zolendronic acid without subsidence? No, zolendronic acid. If if they are symptomatically better and their activity is improved, I wouldn't do a DEXA scan. If it has not improved. Then actually is the indication. So, like Sir was asking about DEXA scan, I really feel it is more of if somebody is not responding, then you do a DEXA scan because that means they are not responding to your treatment. 
and then you have to look for some other factors, maybe some antibodies or something else, where they are resistant to the drugs that you're giving, and then pursue second and third line treatments. Or uh, T score can be given to you only by the DEXA scan. So. Uh, I would say if they fit into the age group, they've already presented with a, a you know, you take an X-ray and see a fracture because of collapse with, you know, kyphosis and a hunchback, you can just go ahead with treatment. If somebody's presenting with vague symptoms which you cannot really identify with anything else, then I would go ahead with the Texas cavity. Definitely. Sir, any special precautions uh, you take or anything like that? So uh, basically, you want to see that uh, renal function is okay. And, yeah, and uh, you uh, other than this. sorry. Other than this, no. other than this, any other uh, kind of hypercalcemia state that should not be there. Uh, whether there is any other disease, it can very well be safely given in patients who are on disease modifying drugs and glutathione. So that is not a problem if their renal function is okay. Uh, you have to tell the patient, because it's important, if you've given a patient a zolendronate infusion and they go home, that they're going to get fever. So you might have to give them paracetamol. If they don't get fever, the zolendronic acid is probably not acting. Okay. Everybody should get the full Yeah. Sir, the Ampo people use a 4 mg Yes. We use a 5 mg. What is this basic difference? Uh, and they use it monthly. Every dose they use. I, I, to be honest, I, I wouldn't have to answer that. I, I don't really know why, but I think they are, they are more for treating hypercalcemia states because of uh, metastasis that you're getting. You're trying to drive the calcium back into the bone. So four milligram and five milligram, it shouldn't make that much of a difference, and really. Uh, but if you're giving it repeatedly, I suppose four is better. Uh, there was some issue. Some people talk in terms of your magnesium down. There is, there, there is a, some amount of arrhythmias uh, and all are common, but uh, not very common in the practice. No. no. But uh, some people talk in terms of arrhythmias and all, in terms of magnesium as a... Yeah. So again, that is in relation to secondary osteoporosis and secondary uh, 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 hypercalcemia states. There is a lot of uh, these tablets, you know, calcium supplements, which give magnesium along with them. So uh, magnesium is a trace element which, as you know, is required for muscle and the heart specifically. So in people who have disorders, you have to be careful about giving magnesium. And uh, if you are giving overdosing with magnesium and uh, already you are giving things like this, I suppose you can get hypomagnesium. But uh, uh, again, that is more of secondary and complex medical state. So I would I would do that in liaison with my physician. Because uh, some, somebody here had some issue initially in the very initial uh, right. started off. So a lot of spe speculation regard to use calcium studies or magnesium studies. Or uh, I don't think there is any you know, clear evidence on that and I'm sorry to say I, I have limited experience on that part so I would just consult the uh, physicians. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Just what you feel is osteopenia and the patient has overall a good activity. I would think just dietary supplements are enough. If they have generalized symptoms of, uh, if if there is arthritis, it would if if it is osteoarthritis, we'll have to differentiate here. If it's osteoarthritis, it will be localized to one or two joints, and then you can start thinking about local therapy for that, that joint. Whether it is conservative or operative is a different thing. If it is a generalized thing, it is probably worthwhile investigating whether they have some inflammatory component to it. If it is not that, and they just have generalized pain, then you could probably start thinking of that as probably just fibromyalgia, or if it is not that, it is probably in those groups, I would go ahead and do a DEXA scan. I wouldn't treat a relatively young patient with bisphosphonates just because they come with generalized symptoms. That is the indication I would use a DEXA scan in the, in the average patient. If they have a specific factor, some fracture, this and that, yes. If not, investigate. Okay, thank you, Dr.